thanks for this intro. Uh, first, let me say, I'm, I'm, I, when I submitted the proposal for doing this talk here, I, I did not expect to be put into a room with, with such a big audience in front of me. Uh, yeah, anyway, now I'm here, and first of all, <laughs> this is not a talk addressed to uh, open WRT developers. So the technical level is, uh, it's, it's, it's really on a more abstract, almost sometimes philosophical level here. But I thought about it, and I really, I, I made the decision that this is the, this is the most important point I want to make, uh, get across here to you. And, um, and um, I think I'm preaching to the choir here in, in when I say that we are all interested to keep developing technologies, communication technologies that allow us to communicate more directly and more authentically. So we need more of the things on the right side and less dependency on the, thing, on the infrastructure that looks like on the left side here. Problem is, for example, in wireless mesh networks where this is very easy to do, or we will see, it's an interference limit problem that we run into quite fast. So it's not, uh, the performance of the network is, is not dependent on uh, creating distances that are small enough to get at least some signal to the receiver. It's more or less the interdependencies of multiple transmissions in a shared common medium. Um, and actually, every wireless network um, eventually becomes an interference limited network uh, with a growing node density. Um, there, it's even analogous to society itself because right now we are starting to live in a society that is attention limited. The, uh, the relation attention interference is uh, pretty strong if you look at it. Obviously, the technology that we like to use to build meshes, we refer to it as IEEE 11 WLAN, or most people nowadays globally say Wi-Fi, although it's a trademark term from the Wi-Fi Alliance. And the link speeds that these protocol families offer are sort of growing uh, like monotonously. It's really uh, strange to look at the throughput figures that some vendors now give in the range of, I don't know, seven gigabits per second or something like that. Although the hardware itself starts to look really ridiculous. But anyway, this is the most suitable technology that we now have. It's, it's becoming, thanks to Moore's law, extremely cheap, extremely powerful, but it needs one thing to work, which is free channels. And especially 11AC gear is directed toward five gigahertz usage. And if you look, for example, in North America, in order to get these gigabit speeds, we must use channel widths in the order of 80 or 160 megahertz even. And then we have the same situation that we know from years ago in the ISM 2.4 gigahertz band. So I'm a fan of wireless mesh networks. Uh, in the previous talk, we heard what great things we can do with meshes. And um, this this passion caused me to look into ways how to improve the overall performance of meshes, of true meshes. Uh, and there are many spots you can look at improving. This is just one way to categorize. So I looked at um, rate controlling and um, power controlling. So these are things that are not really standardized. So there is room for improvement, room for optimization for mesh networks. I also looked at rather sort of fancy things like network coding for some time. 
And I also had the chance to look at congestion control because I worked for a project that um, defines the distributed congestion control in the vehicular uh, communication field, so like uh, ITSG5, we like to call this. Um, and when I did all this, uh, over the years, it came to me that there is one strange thing uh, missing here, actually, which is um, we know that these networks are interference limited mostly, or they all become interference limited in the end. But where exactly can I measure this interference anywhere when I'm participating in such a network? So I'm actually making, trying to make the point here that in order to make the, this distributed system uh, robust enough, or at least more robust, um, we need to implement some way that lets us uh, directly observe what are the resources that are uh, available currently in that channel, in that room. Like right now, in here there are probably lots of, there's the, the 2.4 gigahertz band is buzzing because of probe requests and, and I don't know, uh, the normal uh, activity with the access points in here. Where, where in, our, in our devices can we see that? And most people think, yes, it's possible, because basically you're just looking at the information that is decodable by, your, by the radio front end, and then you can sort of uh, assume that you have a very good correlation with exactly this is the activity that is um, actually taking place right now. But the thing is, because it's a distributed coordination that is done when accessing the medium, actually it's called distributed coordination function, so pretty straightforward in the standard, which is more or less the equivalent of, uh, so it's mimicking human communications in a sense that if you put several polite people in a room and they want to have a discussion, they do exactly that. So they listen if the medium is free, if it's not free, they back off and wait until uh, the person who is currently speaking has finished the sentence, or appears to have finished the sentence. So, and since this is distributed over space, um, every receiver has a different perception of exactly what, is, is the medium now active or not? Am I allowed to speak or not? And 802.11 works in a way where it just defines sort of an sort of a power threshold, or most 90% of the devices work like this. There's a power threshold. For example, yeah, in OFDM, it's only a power threshold. And so there's a power threshold defined, and every node that is waiting to get the next opportunity to transmit is basically waiting until the channel power goes below the threshold. This is a very simplistic uh, shortcut now, but essentially that's the way it works. So, for example, this should be a visualization of instantaneous power at the antenna input of a Wi-Fi radio. And this is, this is not a real uh, me measurement. This is basically something that I, uh, try, uh, um, I try to um, come up with a visualization as it, as it actually looks like, but cleaned it up a little bit more. So this is not, a, this is not the real measurement data here. But you see that there are these blocks, and these blocks correspond to individual OFDM frame transmissions around the place. And the green line is the, is the, the, the line from which a... Uh, so this could be sort of the, the carrier sensing threshold at, at our current receiving device. And what happens is that you see there, maybe it's not so perfectly clear, but there are multiple overlappings all the time. So there is not like a, a slot structure because it's a distributed phenomena and everybody has a different perception. It's really like if we want to have a, a clear discussion in that room, it would be pretty impossible just via unamplif unamplified uh, verbal talking here. So what an actual receiver uh, is trying to understand are those parts that are non-overlapping. And what he forwards to the upper layer is basically just the stuff that he could decode. 
and that is sort of the um, the fundamental thing that uh, that I want to sort of point out that there that uh, the whole channel load the, the 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 receiver or the upper layers they don't they don't see the actual utilization of the channel so there is a sort of loss of information that happens there all the time because our equipment is currently working like it works you only get what you could understand and you get some signal strength information annotated to it and this is sort of the philosophical part here that is some media theories if you like keyword is marshall McLuhan here they say all the technologies we develop are extensions of our human capabilities. And if you think about it, wireless communication is a little bit, could be said as an extension of our ears and of our mouth. And this behavior here is equivalent to the situation where we are all having sort of electromagnetically, so we have, we have ears in the, in the 2.4 and in the 5 gigahertz spectrum, and when we go into a noisy room, we basically hear nothing we just hear the stuff that someone is uh, speaking to us really standing directly and, and shouting in our ears. That's what we can hear. But we don't hear that there is activity in the room. We don't look for another room, for example, because we cannot even perceive the noise here. And that's a very long message saying that we now made a patch for OpenWRT uh, that when you go for uh, real-time graphs, so OpenWT has this real-time graph view, before you even connect to anything, before you even see any other, before you do any, any kind of association or attachment, you see now a third graph, uh, additional to the two that were there before, and this third graph just shows you on the current channel that you're listening to, this is the level of activity, like in percent, over time. Uh, I thought about doing a demo here, but I think it takes too much time, so I'm just showing you some screenshots here. The, uh, we call it QBSS load. That, that I will explain later. But what you actually can do now is we see the actual channel utilization. We see what are the resources left that we can use to communicate with. And this has uh, many useful I mean, applications just because it's observable right now. And we thought, well, isn't it uh, even better if we can tell about the situations, uh, if we can inform? No. The actual reasoning was, now we can observe it at our local node, but it's still difficult to communicate this some way, for example, to clients that want to uh, talk to us. So it's, we, want, we looked for ways to distribute this this measurement data somehow in order to uh, create a global view of what are the resources in this room currently available. And we thought that we should broadcast these local, local observations using beacons. And it turns out if you look into the standard documents, there is already defined a way to do this uh, uh, broadcasting of channel load measurements. And this thing they call it the QBSS load. And there's already standardized the format how you can annotate this load in every beacon that you send. So you add seven bytes of additional information to every beacon. Beacon is normal management information that is transmitted by uh, access points in infrastructure mode or uh, ad hoc nodes themselves. So all we did is basically uh, try to implement this in the software stack on OpenWRT. We, we were aware at the point in time that uh, some access points, for example, um, the sort of enterprise carrier, enterprise grade Cisco gear is already doing that. The reasoning behind this, uh, it enables uh, voice over IP applications to, have, to offer a better quality of service because the handover decisions are better. And so we went forth and uh, tried to put this into an open software stack. Uh, the, the patch itself that does sort of the, the main important things is really, really short. The problem is that I have a background in electrical engineering. 
So I, I, I'm really lousy at uh, kernel hacking, but I have a colleague who sort of has a computer science degree, but he's also completely new to uh, kernel space things. So we pretty much screwed up everything that we could screw, uh, can screw up there and made all the memory allocation and all the lockings the wrong way. But we still were adventurous enough. So basically, this is, this is my colleague here, Arthur Lin. He, so he deserves all the credit for the coding. I, I'm just the guy who sort of suggested it and also uh, managed to get some, some, some funding for it uh, by this U project called Confine. So we were naive enough to do our first trial at the, at the wireless battle mesh uh, in August this year in Maribor. And I will never forget the face of Arthur when uh, we had to sort of quickly find out that our patch totally kernel panics in a situation uh, as is in the battle mesh. So uh, uh, that I, I felt really sorry for, su for suggesting the, the idea. Anyway, we will, we're currently in the phase of uh, sort of polishing it really to make it sort of to convince uh, subsystem developers to, to let this in. Because it's a, it's, it's a, it's a rather nasty thing that we, we are updating fields in a, in a beacon over time, so this is not, not, not a usual thing, but it, we think it's relevant, so we want to go for it. And what it, for example, allows, this rebroadcasting is something like that, so this is a few that you can get when you use uh, a very nice tool called Horst, highly optimized radio scanning tool is one way. So Bruno wrote it, or is maintaining it, and it's, it's pretty useful when you're doing uh, debugging of uh, mesh links. And now we made a little patch to it, so this, the part on the right side is new, and the part on the right side just tells you, okay, these and these MAC addresses now see from their point of view these and these loads. If, it, if, if you look, they are all operating on the same channel, they are all within communication range, so this is, this is an output you see just with your normal Wi-Fi receiver, so I could I could demonstrate it right here with a normal, with a, with a normal Wi-Fi radio. I see access points around here broadcasting the channel, load, fuse, and I see that they're different. So this, this is a perfect demonstration of it's a distributed phenomenon. Everybody has a different perception of noise. Why is this all uh, so relevant? I mean, it's relevant for the cases that were mentioned in the intro, for example, but there is another thing that I'm, there's another reason why I wanted to sort of make this point here, and that is uh, um, currently there's a lot of activity around the five, so there, there, there are lots of things happening because of, because of technology operating in this, they call it the UNII band, the UNI bands, and this activity, uh, uh, one part of it is due to the cellular industry looking at it from an, uh, so they are op they are looking at ways now very concretely to use these unlicensed bands uh, the terms are LTU or license assisted access and I mean it's a matter of regulation whether this will actually be uh, put in place. But it's expected that there, I mean, the whole point of doing this is in order to um, have more control. So cellular industry is looking for ways to expand their domain of control into the, into the unlicensed bands. And the problem is, if this happens, since our Wi-Fi radios cannot understand those differently formatted signals, we will hear basically nothing if this activity in the neighborhood starts to appear. So, these are put, these are some, some, some early uh, measurements that people did that show clearly that the presence of such a, in this case it's an LTU base station, 
will greatly diminish all the performance that we can out of the five gigahertz bands using Wi-Fi. As again, it's, it's a matter of regula regulation, how, how, how strict they will be in this uh, equal access and coexistence. If, they really take it, if you really take coexistence and equal access seriously, there is no point in doing LTU or license-assisted access, simply because if you want to have an equal, equal access, you basically have to use the same medium access protocol. Listen before talk, same, same rights to every node. And then the whole point practically vanishes because it's the, the channel code is not such different between those two standards. And I think that it's partly because of this that now this, this, this discussion has uh, started because uh, No, wait, let me skip this. Uh, the FCC and the European Commission have just, or the FCC is about to, and the European Commission already has put new law uh, into place that now seems to try to uh, uh, make it, I was going to say, if you look at the new law, it says that they want to make it impossible that people change the settings on their routers, and they're especially worried about the uni bands again. And the official reason is always it's about the weather radars there, but I don't, I don't think it's a coincidence that, they are now, that uh, there is now a law being put into place that restricts the behavior of, or restricts the freedoms that we have. Uh, and at the same time, there's, an, there's another secondary user, sort of to say. The primary user is the, is, is the, uh, the weather radars here, and the secondary user was always Wi-Fi, and now it appears that another secondary user wants all Wi-Fi users to be as restrictive as possible. That, that's how I in interpret the whole thing. Um, yo, uh, this channel load patch will allow us, if, that's the, the big if, if we are still allowed to run open software on these things, this channel load patch will at least allow us to detect that there are uh, uh, nearby license-assisted access or LTU base stations that may be the cause of problems there. Um, I think I should come, I have a little, a little comment to make, but I think I skip it and basically the message I'm trying to make here is we should treat these spectrum resources as our commons so, sort of, it, it, it's, um, it's about the right for free speech in, in an electromagnetic way. Th these are the same sort of the, the four software freedoms that Stallman talks about. We need them also, and we have to ensure that we still retain the freedom to express electromagnetically, sort of. That's my point. Here. Questions? Okay. So we have some more time for questions. If you want to ask a question and you're listening on the stream, blow, please go in the IRC. Uh, we have an angel listening there and reading the questions out here loud. If you have a question in the room, please come to one of the six uh, microphones. And I see we already have the first one on microphone number two. Um, just a small question uh, regarding the horse tool uh, where you made a patch uh, where you see on the right side the QBSS. Um, I didn't fully understand because uh, you, ha you said that uh, this uh, QBSS is broadcasted in the beacons, but you could clearly see that normal uh, stations were also shown their point of view of the, uh, how much uh, interference they see. How is this done? Because if it's only the access point sending it in the beacons, how can you see the, the, the station view? No, it's not the station view. It's uh, basically what, I'm, what I wanted to say is that you see several access points there, and the, sort of all of, the, all of those give their individual views. Okay, that, but that gives you a global this, these view. These are all uh, access points. Yes. On, 
All on the same chain. Okay. Yeah. Um, the second question, because you said that some vendors uh, implement this and yeah. it's already in the standards. Yeah. Um, if uh, somebody is using the patch, uh, are these interoperable, comparable? So if, if I have Aruba workstation, Cisco workstation, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, next question from microphone number four. Hello, thank you for the talk. Just a quick question. You had a chart where you showed how the Wi Fi performance degrades if a uh, base station is near my. Yeah. Do you think anybody will go for it because everybody uses Wi Fi? That would be a public outcry. I can't imagine that can ever be reality, right? Absolutely. I mean, li Wi Fi would stop working. We'll see. I mean, I also kept, I'm, yeah, I'm having the same view. I'm just puzzled. Thank you. Okay, uh, I see we have a question up there at microphone number five. Hi, um, I have a short question um, regarding um, measurements. Have you uh, looked at the, um, how this behaves uh, with throughput from access points? So if you can actually um, detect before even you can, uh, or before you transmit data, how the throughput will be? No, but that's an excellent idea. I mean, Building an estimator for expectable throughput would yeah. be now possible with that. That was, yeah, excellent. Thanks. Good. Uh, microphone number four. Uh, hello. What data do you exactly get from the hardware? And is it similar from all the devices? Or yeah. The chips? The, the data we get are cycle counters. They are called cycle counters. And we're tr for this, we're using the busy cycle counters or the receive cycle counters, whatever we like. And these are red registers that are being sort of, in most drivers, they are being copied in, so they are available via the Netlink interface. And you, this patch just reads them out and displays them. It's a very simple thing, actually. And most, most current hardware or most current drivers are exporting this feature, so. So, microphone number one. Hi. Um, do you have an idea how we can keep this spectrum in the commons? So, <laughs> this is a hard I think question. I think the only way we have is to make, make it visible what, what we do with it. Mm. So this, if you, if you take this further, we can see, okay, my neighborhood is full of stuff, um, and 90% of this is LTU based stations, so I will certainly try to do something about it, right? But if you cannot see it, you cannot act. So, uh, now we um, push in very shortly a question from the internet. Do these chipsets measure, measure all interfaces or just use, usage by other Wi-Fi? Sorry, can you Please. say it again? Do these chipsets measure all interfaces or just use, usage of other Wi-Fis? Do these chips? No, no, I don't know. Do you get the question? If the uh, chips use only the um, user interfaces? All interfaces. All interfaces or just the user interface, especially interfaces. Or just by uh, Wi-Fi? Just Wi-Fi, I mean, right? Okay. That's, what, that's what I would say. <laughs> I don't get it, really. So just Wi-Fi? Yeah. OK. Um, microphone number four. Yeah, um, so have you taken a look at um, Aperos Qualcomm spectrum analysis mode for this action? Yes. And does it actually qualify to supplement your data? Sure, sure, sure. It's, it's, it's a nice feature. The, the, when we uh, played with it, we just had the impression that it only sparsely samples. So yeah, it's, it's not... It's only about every half a second or something. Yeah, so it's, it, for, for estimating channel load, it, it's not really that usable. Yeah. But also to get a look at other... You can, you can classify what kind yeah. of interferer that is. Yeah. That should okay. also be put into visualization mode. Yeah, because in. there's no, uh, I know that ABM has options for that on their routers, exactly. but there's no real option on uh, open WRT now to do it. Yeah. And it's really not that easy to do it by hand. So it yeah. <laughs> would but be great to have an option for that. If someone is interested, please come, come, let's talk. Okay, we have time for one last short question. Microphone number four, please. Yeah, um, yeah I just want, did you have experience with five gears, and is there is a possibility to get the information from the client also about the inter activities in there? From the 
uh, which client would you refer yeah, to? Yeah, right? the Wi-Fi client, like your mobile phone, or I don't know. you mean the Wi-Fi client is typically not sending beacons? Is that what you mean? Yeah, that, yeah. that's why. Yeah, yeah. I mean that we can annotate it to other management frames, like the probe requests they all send out all the time. Mm -hmm. It would be a seven bytes addition, which is really small. Okay. Let's just. Okay, for everybody who still has a question, uh, Paul will be in the foyer afterwards, so you can meet him there and ask your leftover questions. Thank you very much. It was a really nice talk. So, a last wow. round of applause for him. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me.